Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. Okay, Craig, you're good. I'm just adjusting my phone so you're nice and close. Anything else? I'm Craig. I'm an alcoholic. Uh, would you care to join me uh, in the serenity prayer? God, grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change, the courage to change the things I can, and the wisdom to know the difference. Um, at this time, we request that you silence all outer world devices like cell phones. Thank you. Uh, welcome to the Thursday night prime time is now meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous. Like I said, my name is Craig and I am an alcoholic. Uh, and we already did the serenity prayer. Uh, the purpose of the Thursday night prime time is now meeting is to talk about the reason to come to Alcoholics Anonymous to expose alcoholism not just as a word, but as a living mind power disease. How the disease appears and functions in our lives today in order to deepen our awareness of what we are up against. Alcoholism is called ism because it is alive and functioning and needs to be treated. We discuss here strictly the disease as it manifests in each of our own personal lives. The way our behavior is this day, the way we react or look at people, places, and things. We do not talk about drunkologues, yesterday's problems, or blaming other people. We talk only about looking inwardly, describing how self behaves in the day we're in. First, we will have a speaker who will talk about the purpose of coming to AA for approximately 25 minutes. Then we will have sharing or questions and answers. Sharing is strictly limited to three minutes. We want everyone to have a chance to participate. We do not allow foul language, as this meeting is recorded and CDs travel all over. Anyway, I'm an alcoholic and my problem is Craig. Armin loves that. Armin loves to hear that. And that's the truth. Uh, I thought liquor was my problem, but as it says in the book, liquor was but a symptom. So we had to get down to causes and conditions. Uh, and uh, I love this program. And to John, thanks for asking me to speak. Uh, and uh, I, I love this meeting. And, and thanks for starting this meeting down here. And it's, it's really great to carry this message. This is the message of AA. We call it prime time. It's specific to uh, that this is prime time. This moment right now is the only moment I belong in, and that's really important. There is one that has all power. That one is God. May you find him now. And it's in our instructions in the, in the how it works in a lot of our literature, but it gets overlooked. So it's how we break down that literature. And basically prime time, we talk more about it. says we talk about our behavior in the day we are in. We don't talk about drunk a lot. We talk about think a lot what my mind, how my mind is behaving, because I'm under a, a twofold, I have a, a, a d- disease that centers in my mind, and uh, it's a physical allergy of the body. Uh, like Dr. Silkworth says, that uh, I drink because I like the effect produced by alcohol, and that basically I'm restless, irritable, and discontented. That's who I am. I'm a restless, irritable, and discontented person, unless I can get that sense of ease and comfort that comes at once by taking a few drinks. So there it is right in the print, Dr. Silkworth telling me that alcohol treats my alcoholism. But uh, I can't drink no more. I don't know about you. That's why I'm here, because I hit a bottom in step one, and my life became unmanageable due to my powerlessness over my alcohol, uh, my drinking, and my using. Um, what we talk about here is uh, the way our mind behaves in the day we're in, because my restlessness, my irritability, my discontentedness causes me to act out. And basically, selfishness and self-centeredness are the root of our dr- troubles, driven by a hundred forms of fear, self-delusion, self-seeking, self-pity. I step on the toes of my fellows, and they retaliate, of course. You know, sometimes seemingly without provocation, but at some time invariably in the past, I have made decisions to get something I wanted based on me that later placed me in a position to be hurt. And, uh, and so i got to look at that. My troubles are my own making. They rise out of me, and I'm an extreme example of self-will run riot. So it's self, 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 and, uh, you know, and, and God, I must get rid of this, or it kills me, it says, and God makes that possible. And so, you know, it kills me because if I keep having this kind of a self-talking mind, chances are I'm going to drink again. But this disease is so deadly, and it is a disease. The big book never called it a disease. It called it an illness. 
uh, in reference to the word disease on page 64, calling it um, a spiritual disease. And then it goes on to say that, uh, you know, I'm mentally and physically ill, and once the spiritual malady is overcome, I straighten out mentally and physically. That's why it's a spiritual program of action, because I, my spirit is not fulfilled. And I joke around a lot, it's not really joking, that we're all spiritual people because we were drinking to lift our spirits because we weren't able to cope with life the way it was. They call it spirits, right? And I'm getting high. I want to get to that place where I feel one with the universe. And, uh, but I need something to do that. But this program teaches me how through the pain. And uh, suffering is optional. Pain is a requirement, they say. Uh, I went through a lot of suffering. Uh, you don't have to go through that. And, and you can have this message right now. It's not about time. There's a lot of people with a lot of time. I have a little bit. I got ten and a half years. But if I don't treat my alcoholism today, I don't have recovery today. Just like if I don't drink today, I don't get drunk today. And if I don't, you know, get high today, I don't get high today. It's the application. The application of drinking is to pick it up and drink it. And the application of the steps are to take a principle, not just to read them, not just to think about them, to practice bringing them into my life. So in step one... And, and what we talk about here, there's a dash here. Some people read the dash out loud when they're reading it. But basically, its function in the English language is to, uh, <laughs> you like that one, huh? I uh, got to start it at another meeting. Yeah. Anyway, uh, what its job is in the English language, and I, I like to make things as important, every comma, everything, the more important I make it, the more important it is. I can say it doesn't mean anything, and then it doesn't mean anything. It's all how important it is to me. How do I bring these words? How do I make them come alive from my life today? So the dash, its job is to connect each statement so they, they connect together, but it's also its purpose is to let them stand alone. And so the only place alcohol is mentioned is in the first half of step one. Everybody thinks step one is a one-part deal, but it's a two-part deal, and that the first half... I had a sponsor, Ted, and he said it eloquently. The first half is about the drinking. The second half is about the thinking. And so, um, you know, I know my physical part is that once I pick up a drink, and if you're not sure you're an alcoholic, uh, in the big book it says, uh, in We Agnostics, which is on 44, that if, if when you sincerely want to stop drinking, you find you can't quit entirely, or when drinking you can't control the amount you drink, then you're probably an alcoholic. So, there's the question answered. Now, I'm not as bad as him. Maybe I'm not a real alcoholic. If that's, those two symptoms are, are true for you, uh, that's probably the case. And if so, you suffer from an illness which only a spiritual experience will conquer. There's the solution. See, only an act of providence can remove this, you know. In step one, it says, who cares to admit complete defeat? And I read that, and I know defeat, and I would defeat it from alcohol and drugs, and it's pretty easy to surrender to that, because I got in some trouble, you know, I got put in a rehab, or some of us get court ordered, or some of us go to hospitals, or lose our wives and jobs, or all of the above. So for the for the for the alcohol part of it, it's pretty easy to do the first three steps. It might not be easy to stay sober, but to initially admit that I'm an alcoholic, to come to believe that AA can help me, and that I'm going to let let it and you know do this thing. But for the unmanageable thought life, that's a hard one. I've got to be convinced that any life run on self-will can hardly be a success. And that's really hard because I've been given a free will. And it's, this is the fall of man. My free will is not free. It got me here. It's the decisions I make with a broken picker that say, do this or do that, and I make the wrong choices. Yeah, should I smoke some crap tonight? Oh, that sounds good. Should I be in a tank catching off? Mm, yeah, anyway, we don't talk about drunk locks. <laughs> but, uh, you know, I've got ten and a half years abstinence. I've done the first half of step one perfectly. Relapse isn't a part of my story. But I hit my real bottom at two years sober. And and that was with the prime time message here. Charles remembers, you know, we'd be over Ted's house and at a Saturday meeting and everybody and Ted's talking for hours and the message of recovery was there and I couldn't let it in because the fight was on. I'm holding on. See, we try to hold on to our old ideas and the result is nil till we let go absolutely. Everything is an old idea. I have an idea of how things should be, expectations of what life should look like. Society tells me happiness is two cars in a garage, a white picket fence, a wife and two and a half kids, you know, 
uh, and all the things that are going to make me happy, and they never make me happy because I have a disease of not enough. When I, when I place my happiness on stuff, it's, there's never enough. And that's putting the cart before the horse. See, when I get this, I'll be happy. It's always about the destination, and I'm missing the journey. And so I had to learn this, and I had to hit that bottom at two years where I really wanted to die. I mean, it just seemed... And I have two loving sons. I would never want to kill myself, but I was in that much pain. And uh, my quick little story, I said to God, hey, God, I got a plan. I want to die, but I don't want my sons to suffer. Give me a heart attack. You know, it's a, it's a respectful disease. It runs in my family. People will feel sorry for me, and my kids will be okay. Yeah, that's the best my mind could do. And that, that's the warped mind, you see. And something happened. God said, okay, you're dead. Enough about you. Come help me help my kids. And see, it's by dying that one awakens to eternal life. It's the dying of the old ideas that I can wrest satisfaction out of life if only I manage it well. I'm not just a, an alcoholic with alcoholism. I've, I've got a, an addictive need to control situations and outcomes. I need you to behave the way I want you to behave. Didn't you get the, the memo? You know, if only you do this, uh, everything will be okay. You just didn't do it right. And I'm really good at blaming you, you know. If you didn't, I wouldn't have done that if you didn't do this, you see. So what our program helps us to do is to get an understanding. And one, you know, who cares who make complete defeat? Practically no one. Who's that practically no one? I am. I'm, I don't want to do this. Admitting is something done with reluctance. It says every natural instinct cries out against this idea of personal powerlessness. See, lack of power, that was our dilemma. So we had to find a power by which we could live. And it had to be a power of greater than ourselves, obviously. Where and how are we to find this power? Well, that's exactly what the big book was about. Its main object was enable you and I to find a power greater than yourself that will solve your problem. Not just alcohol. I'm the problem, like I said. It's me and my broken picker with my free will. I got a God that loves me so much. I don't know what God is. God's a word. It's a job. It's a concept. Deep down inside every man, woman, and child is the fundamental idea of this thing called God. It's a construct. What it tells me, though, is uh, I don't need to believe in anybody else's conception of it. Uh, my own, however inadequate that may be, is sufficient enough to produce that contact with this thing called God. It's, it's a power of the universe. It's the power of all things. But you see, I always separate myself with my ego that it's something out there. It's only inside that he may be found. AA has taught me how to pray correctly, how to stop thinking about me and my needs because I'm selfish and self-centered to the nth degree. Everything's self, self, self. Self-pity, self-justification, -just, self self-rationalization. I'm the best at that. And it's, that's how I coped and got through life, but it was uncomfortable. So I drank and I used, and that was my coping me mechanism for 36 years. I went to a party in 1968, and I left in 2002. That's the, you know. And, uh, and it worked. It worked really good for a long time. But it stopped working, and otherwise I'd still be out there. And, you know, the good news is, and it was horrible. It was an unpalatable truth to hear this, that only an act of providence. Glass in hand, I warped my mind to such, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, for destructive drinking and for destructive thing, and such an obsession of the mind that only an act of providence could remove it from me. That's in step one in the first paragraph. It's telling me right away that there's no only means no other way. i got to go to something providential, which is, divine guidance. And so I got to see that uh, my bankruptcy is growing human concerns is complete. I'm not just bankrupt from drinking and using. I thought that was my only problem. That was just a symptom. I am the problem, and, and I couldn't handle how I was living my life. Nothing was going the way I planned. Nothing was happening the way I thought it was supposed to be. So I was a loser. I was a victim. And this program teaches me to stop thinking that way. I can't run the show anymore. I can't do that, and I don't have to. And it's so beautiful. I love my life today. I had to go through what I went through. I wouldn't trade anything. I'm here as a result of, of a, I had a 30-year relationship. I was married for 23 years. Two loving sons. I was a faithful husband. Um, my wife left me about 13, 14 years ago, like 98. And... That was it. Like, God, how could you do this? I'm a family man. Isn't that what you want? You know, I'm doing everything. And, and, and I was mad at the world. I was mad at God. I was, you know, blaming my wife. And, uh, you know, he gave her a free will. That's what I learned here. And I learned how to start seeing 
my part in everything because I can't change you. I can only change me. And that's the humility to start seeing who I am in four and five. And in six and seven, start to be willing to have them removed. And in eight and nine, rectify those wrongs. Right the wrongs of my past. How do I make this right? And I don't say I'm sorry. Saying sorry is what I've done my whole life. I'm sorry. I'm an alcoholic. I'm sorry. I'm an alcoholic. No. I did this. It was wrong. You know, um, I, and I promise in the future never do this. I want to right this wrong. What can I do to make it right? Is there something else that you would like to tell me that I'm not even seeing maybe? And maybe even ask for forgiveness. I don't have to say I'm sorry. I don't need to crawl before anyone. Because it, it comes off as an I'm sorry because I'm telling them I know what I did. And, uh, and uh, you know, and something happens when I do that. These steps are incredible. It gives me a chance to get a relationship with God in one and two and three. One, I'm defeated. I admit I don't like it. Almost none of us like to admit we were real alcoholics. And uh, admitting, like I said, is something done with reluctance. I tell this example. It's really, you know, somebody told it to me, and I love it. Somebody says, you stole that. And I say, no, I didn't. They say, you stole that. No, nope, I didn't. Well, we have you on video stealing that. Okay, I admit it now. It's a good example of what admitting is. It's done with reluctance. I don't like it. But you see... It says we know that little or no good can come to any alcoholic until he first accepts his devastating weakness and all its consequences. Until I so humble myself to that fact, my sobriety is precarious and of real happiness, real happiness, I'll know none at all. See, that's what I wasn't finding. It was eluding me, real happiness. I didn't come here to endure life, to endure sobriety. You know, because that's what it seemed like at first. Oh, man, I'll never be able to smoke another joint. I'll never be able to have a, another drink. I'll never be able to do this. I'll never be able to, oh, what fun is life? That's going to my mind for the information. When I came to AA, my mind said, what a bunch of losers. This is pathetic. This will never make me happy. I'd rather die. Give me the gun now. And, and uh, you know, and today I love AA. What changed? AA didn't change. It was me. The minute I stopped arguing, the minute I stopped fighting, the one is I quit debating and just accepted my devastating weakness. In the first half, it's the drinking. In the second half, it's the thinking. And any of these principles, you can sub substitute thinking for drinking, and it will work the same way. You know, it's the great obsession of every abnormal drinker that he may someday drink like a normal person, and it is the great obsession of every abnormal thinker that he may think like a normal person. You can take the 20 questions to see if you're an alcoholic, and you can substitute drinking for thinking. It works exactly the same. And I can't speak for you. I can only speak for myself. I have an unreasoned distortion of judgment. You know, this ism, this ism, it is in me today. At ten and a half years, over any considerable period of time, I get worse, never better. I'm under the grip of a progressive illness. These are principles from my life. But I have recovered. The good news is I have recovered because I'm in recovery at the moment. Right now I'm treating my alcoholism. I'm here. I've had a spiritual awakening as the result and the promise of step 12. That's a promise. If you do the work the way it's outlined. And I'm here trying to carry this message to others, especially alcoholics. That's how it was originally written. And most importantly, to practice these principles in all my affairs, every moment of every day. Now, that sounds like quite an order. But what are my choices? My choice is to keep going on like I do. And if I keep going on like I do, nothing will change. My past will be my future. Nothing changes if nothing changes. And that's one of the definitions of insanity, to keep doing the same things over and over, expecting different results. And, uh, you know, I, know, I can quote stuff. There's a lot of information here. But if I don't do this stuff, it doesn't work. So for those that read page 86, 87, and 88, it's good to read. I need to read to get the knowledge. But if I'm not doing what it says, for instance, on awakening, this is in the 11th step, but anyone can practice it. On awakening, we look at the 24 hours ahead. Well, that's what I usually do. We consider our... Plans for the day. Wow, that's when my alcoholism goes on because I look at it with self and it's like, oh, crap, how am I going to do this? Life sucks. I hate my job. I hate everything. And nobody's doing it right. There's no God. I can't feel God. What happened? I was recovered last night. It's all gone. But it says before we begin, we ask God. See, I can't do any of this. I, and, and I don't know what God is. I have no idea what God is. But I, I have the absolute certainty that God is. 
I have the absolute certainty that the Creator, whatever that might be, the Creator of all things, all intelligent, all knowing, all forgiving, all loving, uh, has commenced to accomplish those things for me I could never do by myself. You know? And uh, I'm so grateful for it today because I wouldn't trade a thing in my life. My wife leaving me, you know, hitting a bottom, you know, being a tent in my living room, catching on fire, any of that stuff. Uh, being put in a rehab. Everything led me to where I am. And this program offers that because there's a, there's a, an amazing way to live here. It's, it's heaven on earth is what it is. And what that is is heaven is a state of mind where you have the absolute certainty that God is working in your life. I don't have to run the show anymore. I don't have to figure nothing out. I do the next required thing. I take God into everything I do. And it works. And when I don't do that, it doesn't work. It's a principle. You know, uh, principles are truths. They're laws. They're doctrines. And AA's 12 steps are a group of principles, spiritual in their nature, which is practiced. Keyword, practiced as a way of life can expel that obsession to drink in the first half of step one. But most importantly, can expel that obsession to think the way I do in the second half of step one. And enable you and I, the sufferer, to become happy and usefully and whole. That's all I ever wanted. You hear people talk about I was never comfortable in my own skin. And our founder, Bill W., couldn't go to a party until he drunk. It's a great social lubricant, alcohol. It lets me talk to the women. I feel taller, better looking. I have hair. Uh, you know... I had here then, but uh, anyway, uh, I'm skinnier. <laughs> uh, but you know what? None of that stuff matters. That's all, you know, narcissism and all that vanity and all that crap. I care so much. Nar vanity, the inordinate concern for the love and approval of others. I care so much what you think about me that I will compromise my integrity and I'll become a hypocrite. And I'll say things behind your back just to please someone else because they're talking crap about you. And I want to be in with you. So I have to see that stuff now and ask God to help me to not be that person anymore. I have to be willing to look at how ugly I can be sometimes. Uh, you know, we're all alcoholics. We're all humans. We have imperfections. And that's the beautiful thing. And none of us have been able to maintain anything like perfect adherence to these principles. That's the good news. We are not saints. We seek spiritual progress rather than perfection. So the whole idea here is the humility to keep falling off the horse, dusting myself off, and asking God to help me get back up on the saddle so that I can have a good ride again. And I'll ride until I hit another bump in the road, and I'll fall off. And, I, you know, I think I'm bad. I think I'm no good. I'm not doing it right. No, this is all about the journey. It's how I pick myself up. It's how I do this thing. It's how I find more God. Through adversity, I come to believe more and more because this is where I find God. Like I said, it says everywhere, and this is in the 12 and 12 page 75 and step 7, which is all about humility. And all 12 steps are a degree of humility. Each one has a purpose. The foundation principle is humility. But it says everywhere in AA we looked and listened and we saw failure and misery transformed by humility into uh, priceless assets, you know, and, and what happens, pain becomes the price of admission into a new life. See, without pain, I don't grow. I don't grow from comfort. And I, I'm a creature of comfort. You know, and it, and it says what happens is we, we begin to fear that pain less and desire the humility more. See, the pain teaches me to how to get humble because and, and initially happens from being forced to humble pie. I get beaten into submission. Initially in step one, I get, you know, beaten to a state of reasonableness from my alcohol. The al I can't control my drinking, and I can't stop on my own. That's pretty humbling. And then they tell me I can't use my mind correctly. That it's a, it centers in my mind, and that my mind is warped. I can't trust it. And I lack power? Come on. You know, and we talk a lot about, I can tie my shoes. I can drive a car. But when I drive the car, you better watch out. Because you're in my way, and I'm going to chase you down if you do something wrong. I'm going to give you the finger. I'm going to get out of the car and rip the door open and pull you out and give you a driving lesson. And I've done this kind of crazy stuff. It's really insane. I'm not a tough guy, but I thought I was. Uh, you know, I'm in Philly. Philly Street, like, you know, big deal. Anyway, I'm an idiot. And, uh, and I have to keep seeing I'm an idiot and uh, not act out. The ego is impulsive. It, it's impatient. It can't wait to be right. It must let you know now that you're wrong. 
I have to let you know. And I, I'm, the, it's, the, the, the characteristics of ego is defiance, impatience, grandiosity, and omnipotence. That's we talk a lot about Dr. Harry Tebow. He was one of the he was a psychiatrist back in AA's pioneering time, and uh, he stud, he he couldn't get us sober. Dr. Silkworth, a medical doctor, couldn't get us sober. They could lock us up for thirty days, but uh, he had a patient, a woman named Marty Mann who couldn't get sober, and when the big book came out, he got one of the 400 original copies, and he gave it to Marty, and she got sober, and she took to this program. She's one of the first women, and he was intrigued that this book did something he could never do. So they got together a few psychiatrists, and they studied a group of the first 100 men and women, and they were looking for was the similarities, not what was different, and the one thing they found in common was our egos and how childish we were, and how we hated to hear that. He called it an infantile ego, His Majesty the Baby, King Baby, and how I tolerate frustration very poorly. I don't like to hear no. You know, I'm the king, don't you know? You know, if you do it my way, everything will be fine, but don't disobey the king, because you're all here for me. You know, and I have to see this in myself, and what a big baby I am. You know, I, I was in the line at the bank one day, and this baby was flailing and screaming. It was a long line. I'm thinking, that's me. He can get away with it, but that's how I feel. I can't act out like that, but I do. I do. I stomp out of rooms. I, I, you know, how dare you not do it the way the king says to do it. And then there I go yet once again, and I have to see it and humble myself. I don't, can't tell you how many times, even recently, my tail goes between my legs. It's all about humility. Here I go again, God. Could you help me? And, and my friends, could you forgive me? And, you know, and I always come back. And because, you know, when they say keep coming back, that's one of the principles of it. I got to keep coming back. I got to keep getting up on the saddle. I'm doing the best I can in the moment I'm in with a power greater than myself. And it's all about growth. One of the good things is I can only demonstrate where I'm at. I can't, and we always want to be somewhere else. That's my ego. It's never satisfied where it is. It's always looking for more. That's its function, is to want. So I'm always in a state of un- ingratitude. I never see how abundant my life really is. And we're all blessed. We just don't all know. Because if I'm looking at what I don't have, that's when I'm, I'm in a state of uh, ingratitude. I'm looking at my cups half empty. And so ego says, oh, they have this. You don't have that. You should have more. You know, you're never going to have this because I go future surfing, and the future is always where fear is, and and fear of losing what I have, not getting what I want, coupled around the instincts of money, security, and sex, uh, uh, and societal instincts. And, or I go to the past, and I'm filled with regret and remorse. And so that's why prime time is now, right here, right now, this moment. This is prime time. This moment is beautiful when I have a power greater than myself, and I'm truly in this moment. So maybe you're here right now. Maybe you're listening with your ears. Maybe your mind is kind of listening. You're thinking, what am I going to eat after this meal? I've got to pay that bill later, you know. I'm God damn, that hurt. I had that fight with him or her. and You know, I'm the kind of half listening. So I've got to recognize it. See, the awareness of what my mind, because I've been letting it loose. It's an old habit. I have to start becoming aware of my alcoholism, what we call it here. Alcoholism, ego, and self. And self is the subject I care most about. I may not be very much, but it's all I can ever think about. And it's all about, you know, you know, somebody's car got hit. Oh, that's really a shame. Your car got hit. Oh, now it's a big deal. Of course, it's my car. I got to deal with it. Oh my God, I don't have a car. You know, but it, it's understandable. But still, if I can pull myself back and look from a third person, it's really helpful. God, can you help me do it? See, I can't do any of this. I can try all I want. It tells me I can't not be selfish. We had to have God's help. I could try all I wish, all I want. I could wish it away. Same with forgiveness. I need to practice forgiveness, but I can't do it. We had to have God's help, and I need God to help me to take these steps. I can't really take them. I can do them with intelligence. But God, could you help me to see this differently? Could you give me the willingness to be willing? Because all I have is honesty, open-mindedness, and willing. Can I really be honest, or am I still bullcrapping myself here? You know, because that's what I'm really good at. No, I've been, that's why I drunk for so many years. I couldn't really look honestly at myself. See, this is grasping and developing a manner of living which demands rigorous honesty. And cash register honesty is very important in the three-dimensional world. But this is a fourth-dimensional existence. The three-dimension is where all my problems are. That's where my living is. My job, the car, the girl, the house, the this, the that, the money. This is where the fourth dimension is. And like it says, and there is a, in that fourth dimension, you can't measure 
You can't see. You can't weigh it. It's where our sense, our intuitive sense operates. This is where our thought life is, our prayer life. And it's real. It's more real than anything. And I've come to accept this in my life and surrender to the fact that my own thinking has got me in trouble. And then, two, I come to believe that something greater than myself, uh, greater than any human power, could restore me to soundness of mind. And then, three, I let go and let God. I made that decision and willing to let, you know, God run the show as he's understood by me and I take the rest of the steps and something happens and, and I go one through nine I clear the records of my past and I live in 10 11 and 12 and every day I keep brushing off the new resentments I keep looking for resentment selfishness dishonesty and fear when they crop up when they crop up I ask God at once to remove them and I turn and I share it with someone I make amends if needed and then I turn my thoughts to someone else see my very life as an ex-problem drinker depend on my constant thought of others and how I may best meet their needs. And that's not what I was doing before. I don't pray for me anymore. I know this God loves me so much. He knows exactly what I need. I say, thy will not mine be done. And then everything is in God's hands. I don't need to draw anything. God, I give God a clean white canvas. And he's drawing me a beautiful masterpiece. And I can just sit back and watch the show. I was sitting the other night with someone, Kristen, I think. And a, 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 a shooting star came out of sky. And she said, make a wish. And I said, I just want what I have. I'm, I'm so thankful for the way my life's unfolding because I know God's in it. And uh, this is for everyone, all men, all women. We're all God's kids, and we all deserve the kingdom of heaven. And uh, the Garden of Eden never left. It's still right here. You just need to let go of self to find it. Anyway, thanks for letting me share. Okay. Uh Let's see. Uh, it is now time for the seventh tradition, and the treasurer will pass the basket. Please be as generous as possible. If you have a court card, please put it in the basket so we can sign it. And at this time, we will open the podium for sharing and or questions. Who would like to begin? I'm Aaron, real quick. I'm, I have alcoholism, and um, I... Thank you so much for your share. Um, I was uh, thinking about um, this this new character that that's talked about a lot in prime time. I understand that I have to build a new character, otherwise um, I'm going to still behave the same way that I've always behaved, and so. Praying and meditating um, in the day that I'm in is good, but it doesn't appear that that's going to do anything about this uh, this character that needs to be built. Because the character is, um, is how I behave. It's just how I behave. What's at the root of... What's at the root of my of my behavior? What, why do I behave the way I behave? So, so I can pray and meditate, which is what I'm told in AA. But it's not going to do much if I don't change uh, if I don't change my character, and that's that's uh, that's hard to hear. Um, so I guess what I'm talking about not I guess what I'm talking about what I'm talking about is awareness. Having a level for my life, I have to have um, awareness of how I'm being in the day that I'm in so I can uh, build a new character because obviously I'm here because of the way I behaved. And I I can be in AA for many years, and I have been and decided to leave. It doesn't matter how many years I'm in AA. it doesn't matter really how much I read the big book. It doesn't matter how many speakers I listen to. It doesn't matter how much how, how much I do the steps. Uh, all the good stuff. Uh, steps, speakers, sponsoring people, all the stuff that we do. Uh, cleaning up AA meetings. Everything that we're told. If I'm still the same character, if I'm still behaving the same way, it doesn't matter. And it's a it's a it's a mind fuck, and it's a it's a it's a it's a waste of time, and um, 
for some reason, I'm not interested in wasting my life too much anymore these days. Um, and so, um, I think, Craig, you might want to, if you want to talk a little bit more about building a new character as opposed to, you know, working the steps and all the stuff that we talk about, I'd like to hear some more about that. Yeah, well, the steps, can, you know, we can go through them like rote sometimes and they're like a chore. But what they are are God's loving discipline to overcome my willful nature. It's about degrees of humility. And the only thing that will change character, I mean, Emmett Fox is one of our founding in a way, a founding member, because they used Sermon on the Mount back in 1934 when it came out. AA formed at the end of 34, and they, before the big book, they used to use Emmett Fox's Sermon on the Mount and other spiritual books, uh, William James, uh, varieties of uh, religious experience and things like that. But prayer was the only way we changed. Prayer. But for us alcoholics, it said, the, the shortest paragraph in the big book says, it works, it really does. But right under it, it says, we alcoholics are undisciplined, so we let God discipline us in this simple way of just outlined. And if the steps are taken in a timely fashion, they will change me. The only way to change my character, I think, is an alcoholic. And I know, you know, and, it, and then it's continuing to work. I never have this. I never graduate. But it's the principles embodied that give me some kind of structure because I'm unstructured. I'm undisciplined. I'm defiant. And it's the humility to just even do it the way someone says. I mean, I, I have a sponsor, and, and, and my, I was arguing and arguing, and I finally stopped arguing. And I said, you know what? I'm full of crap. Can I just follow somebody and just stop being an argument? Because it tells me in the second step to quit debating. Now, my free will keeps wanting to know how this thing works. But the old character can't see the new character. This is experiential. I have to do it to have it. But I won't do it until I see it. And you see, seeing is believing. And this is this is one of the things with God too. We think we need to see this infinite, fourth dimensional uh, being with a three dimensional, limited eyes. Our eyes are so limited. We we have radio waves, we have microwaves, gamma rays, cosmic rays. We can't see them. They're right here. We're using them with our phones, and you know. So you have to have an open mind. There's prayers in the steps. Each prayer has a promise. A promise is an affirmation that I have to claim, provided I do it. In the fifth step, it says, when we take the step, we'll be able to look the world in the eye. We'll begin to lose our fear. See, it's a begin, and something starts to happen. And, the, and, the, and, the, and there's the nine-step promises before we were halfway through. In the tenth step, you know, we ceased fighting everyone and anything, even alcohol. And, and you know, and it, but, but provided... We keep in fit, fit spiritual shape. It tells me it is, and this is in the 10th step, page 85, it is easy to let up on the spiritual program of action and rest on our laurels. We are headed for trouble if we do, for alcohol is a subtle foe. We are not cured of alcoholism. What we really have is a daily reprieve contingent on the maintenance of our spiritual condition. Every day, every moment of every day, <coughs> is, is uh, where we must carry the vision of God's will in all our activities. How important is my life to me? You know, if you wanted to be a concert pianist, you would practice and practice. If you wanted to be a doctor, you'd, you'd practice. If you wanted to be a football player, you'd practice. Spirituality is the same thing. If you want this, you have to practice it. It's not an overnight get-rich-quick scheme. And so whatever is in my mind is a power greater than me. And if I'm not thinking of God and I'm thinking about the problem, that's a power. If I'm thinking about the girl or the guy, that's my problem. That's my higher power. I'm thinking about the money, that's my power. God, now I'm bringing God in. You're my higher power. Help me to overcome this difficulty. And this is where I find more and more God, through the adversities of life. But I'm impatient. I want it now. And I never have it. It's always now I'm going for it. God couldn't would if he were sought. I hope that helped a little bit. I'm Daniel. I'm now Colic. Daniel. And um, I don't usually go to this meeting. Thank you, Craig, for sharing. I uh, normally go to a, a different Thursday night meeting. I couldn't. Let's make it down there tonight, and uh, I, uh, about two weeks ago, I was at uh, my regular Monday night men's stag, and I, uh, I got so honest, you know, um, about what was going on, you know, because I've been going through some stuff lately, which has been really painful, um, self-inflicted, you know, um, and um, the next day, I, I just wanted to share this tonight. I actually feel really nervous about being up here and sharing right now, but I wanted to um, 
share this is, is the next day I had sort of like a revelation just about honesty um, and how important it is for me. Um, the, you know, I've been sober for about just over nine years now. And when I, when I first got sober, um, I, I think the thing that saved my life was uh, being able to open up to people and let them know what was going on. You know, because I, I'm a, you know, I, uh, I, I'm a big person. Well, I'm not a big person, but I pretend that you know everything's fine when I could be, you know, going through some serious stuff. You know, and um, I guess that's uh, you know, some sort of an ego thing. And I think over the past few years, um, I've become attached to my uh, time in in AA. You know, and. Uh, I think, uh, you know, my head sort of latched onto that and said, well, you, you shouldn't be where you're at, so you can't really tell people what's going on. And it felt so good. Um, I just guess, the rep- you know, the past, like, week and a half or a couple of weeks, I've been giving it a really good shot at, like, being honest and, and you know, telling my sponsor everything, you know, and telling my sponsorship family what's going on. And, and um, I feel... Uh, I just feel a bit more real and a bit more grounded, you know, and and I feel like, you know, maybe what I've been going through the the past, you know, uh, few years, you know, I can sort of see a light at the end of the tunnel, whereas, you know, and I I told my sponsor that, I'll I'll close with this, but the the night before I, you know, sort of shared, like, everything at my Monday Monday night, um, men's day, you know, my sponsor said, you know, what's going on? And I said, you know, I'm just going to figure it out. I don't really want to talk about it right now, and I'm going to get through it. And he said, come on, man, you know. And uh, I told me, and uh, it was good, you know, but, you know, it's just crazy, because that was the thing that saved my life, and, you know, nine years down the road, I I uh, think I got it now, so, um, but that's that's it, thanks. Thank you. Alice, I'm an alcoholic. Hi, guys. Um, I loved what you said about... Um, Becoming like a clean white canvas and that God is painting a masterpiece. That's awesome. Thank you. Um, so I've had like a really, really great week and a really great five or six days, you know, not a week, but like five or six days and just feeling a new level of feeling solid and, and safe and, and grounded, which is really great. And I called my sponsor today just to tell her how great everything is. And we get off the phone, and she, I'm working on step six with her right now and um, finishing five and going into six. And she's like, okay, well, remember, she's wanting me to remember these defects that I'm working on or I'm getting, you know, presented with. And she told me that right after we got off the phone. And I was like, but I'm doing great. Like, you don't understand, you know. <laughs> and um, I'm good. And then right after we got off the phone, I – um I had a work thing, and I um, I went in, and it's a technical thing with a hard drive, and the footage is gone. And I went right into the character defect, you know, of, like, anger and self-justification and self-pity, and it's the editor's fault. You know what I mean? And just, like, bam, like, right into it. You know, it was literally like a two-, three-minute thing. And it's just um, – it's amazing – to me to behold how quickly it can happen and how I can let that, you know, spin me out. And, and I really want to blame other people, you know, and I, I really want it to be his fault. And the truth is it's, you know, it's not. It's just like mistakes, accidents, things happen. And in the job I'm in, I need to make sure there's backups and there's a backup for a backup, you know, and one of the most challenging aspects of this for me is seeing, especially when I feel justified, that I have to continue to look at my part and recognize that I can't change other people, but all I can do is grow in my own character. And I don't want to do that, you know what I mean? Because I want a pity party. But um, I'm just so grateful to come in here tonight, you know, because I get just a little wound up over stuff that's ultimately not that big of a deal in the long run. And um, I come in here and I can see and remember why I'm here. And it's just like things quiet down. So it was really great to hear you. And thank you. Hi, I'm Kenton. I'm an alcoholic. 
Thank you so much, Craig. I love you just articulate so amazingly, and I love how you just bring the words of the book in and, and just really explain to me, I mean, just the simplicity and yet the deepness of, of how, you know, this disease, how I feel about it with this disease. And I, I'm going to just bend a little bit, but it will lead to a kind of a question of your experience. Um, I, I had a, almost 15 years sober, and I went out. I slowly, in the midst of the 15, 14-something, uh, got towards the end of it, got into kind of a dryness and got so caught up with my career and fame and whatever, slowly faded out, self-will run riot, slowly and slowly got tighter and tighter and tighter, um, praying but not, you know, for my own means. And I wish I would have found prime time then. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm about two years and two months now, and I started to do uh, – Get into prime time. Been to prime time earlier on, but really more intensely in the last couple months. And I understand it, but I haven't applied it as much as far as experience-wise. But I understand it all, applying the uh, the ego, and I can relate to it, especially from when my I was dry and um, the hundred forms of fear and self-delusion and. Um, Really not being happy in sobriety and, and using that as an excuse of like if it's if the life's gonna be sober, like if I'm gonna if I'm not gonna be happy sober, I just I'll drink, you know. Um uh, one thing that's been going on and it's been amazing, uh this thing of bringing God into a fear of the future. Um, you know, I'll pick some uh, I'll have such a I'll, I'll be having such a great day and all of a sudden one little thing. Either an email, a business thing, a negotiation, or a financial worry in, in the future will come into play, and I'll I'll attach a past fear. I'll think of doom. I'll wake up in the morning and just everything, you know, like. And so uh, what I've really been doing is, is is doing one, two, and three, and, and bringing God into it, like. What you what you've spoken of and what I've heard around these rooms of really be with me and, and let me have faith that it's going to be okay. Um, and what I guess my question is is I do that and, and I apply it and it's great sometimes, um, but sometimes it's like an echo. Of, and, and is it, have you found in your experience? Like, sometimes I'll just envision white light around the problem, or I'll just ask whatever my relationship with my higher power is, is just be with me and really be with me. And there's an ease, and then the noise goes down. What I'm asking you to do, sometimes there, um, if it keeps coming back as an echo, do you have a, do you find that you found a way to, to, to make it just go away sooner where it, it like, the letting go process maybe comes in a sooner sense because the last five years of when I re did relapse, there'd be nights where this echo would just go, 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 keep me up all night and all night and I'd be just like, you know, it would be like neuro neurotic almost to a sense. It's gotten a lot better in this last couple months, but does applying this more and more, do you get better and better at it, I guess? And what do you do and what do you find works really good for you? Aside from writing and just the normal things that people talk about, have you found any special? Any? Great, great question. Very good. You know, it's a monotonous message because it's a monotonous thing that happens in my head. And so, having taken the steps, and I live in ten. Ten is a way of like, and, and we go out because it says it is easy to let up on the spiritual program of action and rest on our lords. We're headed for trouble if we do. For alcohol is a subtle foe. They're, that's an instruction, you know, and this is where a lot of people with a lot of time, they have stopped. Ten is every day. It says this must be continued for a lifetime. It is not an overnight matter. So when something comes up, the, the longer I let it, I talk about a lot, you know, I've cleaned the wreckage of my past, and step five through seven and eight and nine, and now, now I've been given a new sweater. And so now at 10, I'm sitting around the campfire, and the embers are coming and burning the sweat. As long as I go like that, the sweater's going to be fine. 
But what do we do? I should have go, oh, wow, look at that. It's burning that sweater. <laughs> and man, boy, that hurts. <laughs> yeah, you know, and, and, and this is what I do, basically. So the awareness, right, it says we continue to watch for resentment. Four watchwords, resentment, selfishness, dishonesty, and fear. And when they crop up, we ask God at once. See, that's an instruction. That's a time frame. The big book's very specific. At once to remove them. Then we share it. So I, you know, my sponsor, I, I call him and share it first. He says, did you go to God first? No. Hang up. Call me back. And that, what that did was, I said, well, God don't care about it. No, God doesn't care. But it's, a pra- it's the way they asked me to do it. It's about my stubbornness. And now I, I don't call before I do it. You know, and if he's not there, I call Sponsy. And we get into a little loop. Because what happens is I share it just like Daniel said. What he did was a form of a 10-step. He did it at a group level. He took some of the power out of it. Here's the thing. You want to share it one time. You, and, you, and then you, we resolutely turn our thoughts to others. i got to get off of me. See, because it's a broken, merciless obsession. I have, I, alcoholism to me is really a chemical problem. I have broken neurons. They're, they're going like this, right? You know, and it, it, you know, normal people think in a linear, they get a problem, they come up with a solution. Oh, round and round. And you know what that means, right? Crazy, right? So, so uh, I can recognize it. Uh, another application in the 10th step. Now, Emmett Fox says the golden key, which is you don't even think of the problem. You bring in God. But if you have trouble picturing God, then it's called uh, substitution, uh, uh, mental equivalence. So if you can't picture God, you bring in something else. Puppies, bunnies, rainbows, kitties. Something, you know, something good. Because I have a, a, a predisposition to negativity. Alcoholism is a fault-finding negative I'm looking for the wrong. My cups are half empty, and I'm not, it's not fair, and I love self-pity. I will wallow in it. See, on awakening, we ask God to direct our thinking, especially that it be divorced from self-pity, number one. I have to look at that. Why is that number one? Because I love it so much. Because then I can authorize depression, stay curled up in a fetal position, feel sorry for myself, and practice sloth. I authorize it. And, 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 you know, I have to look at this stuff. But as we go through the day, we pause when agitated or doubtful. Well, here's an application. Some people put the watch upside down. They tie a bow around it. I don't need that. I'm agitated all day long. So when I, I pause when agitated or doubtful, and I ask God for the right thought or action. So there's a prayer. Constantly, constantly, all the time, right now, reminding myself, I'm no longer running the show. That's right. The universe is, everything's in perfect order. The earth is spinning, uh, you know, 1,000 miles an hour, going around the sun 60,000 miles an hour. It's spinning around the universe a half a million miles an hour. I ain't doing that. God's doing that. Thank God God is doing it. And humbly, where's that humility? Saying to myself many times each day, thy will be done. See, the greatest prayer I can really say is, Thy will, not mine, be done. I have to mean it. Not mine. Because when I want something, that's when I'm in trouble. What I want is my will. What I do with what I want, that's my will. My thinking. So when I change that and I think of you and I pray for others and I pray for God's will for them, something changes. Trouble need never come. It's only trouble because I say it's trouble. And when you think something is wrong, who's the thinker? Who's playing God here and judging the thing? See? I'm always the one. I'm going to my alcoholic mind saying I'm not doing good or I'm feeling this way or they're doing this to me. It's always alcoholism answering the question. I can't listen to that mind anymore. i got to get that God connection. Anyway, uh, thanks for letting me share. Is that the end? Okay, thanks. Time for second. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.